Welcome to episode 107 of the Sumer Sports Show. I'm Eric Eager. I'm in our studio here. Thomas Dimitrov is in his office. We're going to talk about some cool NFL topics today. But before that, I want to see how Thomas is doing. Thomas, long day of meetings today for both of us. We barely get gotten to talk. That's why I love this podcast. Thomas, how are you doing today? Doing well. It's highly energetic here at, in Atlanta at our office. A lot of ideas popping around here. This is where I wish a whole bunch of that group could come in here and just be a fly on the wall at Sumer because there's there's just unbelievable intelligence flying around. Me aside, of course. I'm just listening to you guys talk, ideas, I mean, calls, meetings. It's a really cool situation. So for any of those of you who want to be an intern, call Eric Eager, the young ones, you could be edified and very, very educated, but by really smart minds like Eric. So I'll leave it at that. It's been fun. Yesterday I was able to go to uh, Kennesaw State to, to recruit some people uh, for our summer internship program. As Thomas said, if you're interested at all, uh, at you know, sumersports.com is the place to go. Um, but you do get to come here. You do get to talk about – um, you know, some really cool notions. The one notion, the two, I think we're going to have two topics today that I think will be very interesting. The first one I want to talk about, because you brought this up at the office yes, uh, last Thursday, I think, before we watched uh, the San Francisco 49ers play the New York Giants it, at, at what I'm still going to call candlestick. Um, you asked about what metric would you use if you were – trying to take just one metric and try to understand the game of football from the quarterback position. And I gave you an answer and I said it was pressure or I said it was you know, basically how often you take sacks. What's the percentage of time you take sacks? I, I didn't really get your feedback on it because I want to get it on the podcast here. I want everybody to be able to see that when you hear that as an answer to that question, Thomas sack rate, well, I, it, again, we can only take one metric. What do you end up thinking about? All right. My initial response is true. 100% need people to move in the pocket. I mean, when we drafted Matt Ryan back in 08, we weren't as cons uh, concerned about it. I wanted a dude that was going to stand tall in the pocket and rip it downfield. As we started getting closer and closer to the end of our time there, Dan and me, I started realizing if I could do it again or if I were ever to be in a spot – to pick another quarterback, I wanted to see what what it would play out as an athletic quarterback, right? And there are many elements to that. So I started thinking more about sack, right? If you can avoid, and avoiding the sack isn't just athleticism, brother. Avoiding the sack is awareness in the pocket. Tom Brady had it. I thought Matt Ryan had it quite what he did quite uh, well at uh, the awareness side. That said, I have always been a person that believes in accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. So that's where my head would go in front of this. I think this is a great opportunity to talk about this. What comes first, accuracy or, or sack avoidance? To me, the only reason I put sack avoidance above accuracy, I think accuracy is super important. And you can look at that a number of different ways. Obviously, we're on sumersports.com. You can look at it from the perspective of completion percentage. You can look at it from the perspective of, you know, adjusted completion percentage or completion percentage over expected. All those things, you know, you can sort of take a look at, um, you know, various data sources. Our data source, I think, uh, is a really good intuitive way for that. But accuracy to me is sort of the second thing that happens after you are able to engineer throws where you can display your accuracy. So when I look at like Justin Fields, for example, Thomas, like I think he was, when you look at like what Tay Seth, our, one of our data scientists did like accuracy over expected was one of the best college football players we've seen uh, at least in like the time that, you know, places like PFF and SIS were charting those data sets. Um, and yet we, when it, when you look at what he's been able or not been able to do since he's joined, you know, the Chicago bears, it's been a really hard road for him. 
And I think that that's partially because he's not able for whatever reason to engineer pockets where it makes a lot of sense for him to be able to complete some passes. And, you know, when I think about uh, young quarterbacks, who, who is the most impressive young quarterback we've ever seen in the, in the NFL post merger, I think that if you adjust for situation and stuff like that, it has to be Dan Marino, right, Thomas. And when you think about Dan Marino, everybody's going to gravitate towards the 48 touchdown passes in 1984. Everybody's going to gravitate towards the, all the records he had, but Dan Marino led the NFL in sack percentage taken. So the fewest sacks per drop back first 10 years of his career and the, including the first seven years of his career, he had a string Thomas where he took six sacks in one season and 19 straight games without taking a sack. I just think that the avoidance of negative plays, in, as well as just the avoidance of pressure, but specifically the avoidance of negative plays. Now, we don't think of Dan Marino as like the ultra athlete that's played that position. Right. We don't think of Dan Marino as like, the, you know, the same way we think about Anthony Richardson or even like Trevor Lawrence. And yet he was able to manipulate the pocket and it just adds such a floor to your offense. It raises your offense, even in the worst times. Right. If the worst thing is an incompletion or sometimes an interception, that's so much better than like losing like Sam Howell the other day coming off with 35 point performance against uh, the Dolphin or sorry, against the uh, um, Denver Broncos took nine sacks against the uh, Washington or against the Buffalo Bills. And it just limits what you can do offensively when you're in second and 17 all the time. Again, I keep coming back to a guy like again, I'm speaking uh Matt Ryan, right? Matt Ryan comes in, was never the ultimate athlete, had an awareness about him. One of the reasons that we decided to pick him in Atlanta as our guide to take us through many, many years was an awareness that he had. And it was comparative to Tom Brady, right? I used him as an example for many years because I happened to be there and I realized how important that was, right? So again, I, it's, it's, it's still tough for me if someone were to tell me, Sack avoidance and, and accuracy. We have some guys out there that can sack avoid well, um, but don't don't have pinpoint accuracy. And I think that's a tough thing. I love what you're what you're presenting here with Dan Marino. Dan Marino, one of the greats, never won a Super Bowl, by the way, right? Did he ever win a division championship? Oh yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking right now at Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan, when you look, 3.8% yeah. sacks. 4.0% sacks. Now he did have a year, his second to last year with you where he led the league in sacks, but you're looking at the years where you guys were really humming, right? 2010, you had the one seed, yeah. 2012, you had the one seed. Um, obviously 2016, when you made the Super Bowl. Six, five? Yeah. Like those numbers are really good, right? Like those numbers are pretty low, you know, even 2017 where you guys were probably, you know, a few plays away from another Super Bowl appearance, you know, those are really good numbers. And you think about what went down in Matt Ryan's career. It wasn't necessarily the completion percentage. Like, these are all high, right? Yards per pass attempt, these are all pretty good. It's the, you know, his sack rate went up, right? And and his ability to avoid pressure. I mean, 7.6, his year in Indianapolis, when you look last season, six, 67% completion, that's not so bad. It's a decent number of interceptions, but not that much, many more than normal for him it was obviously took a lot of sacks. And so, yeah. you know, when I look at that, like I think about, um, you know, a quarterback who very much, you know, you, you probably saw a lot in your eyes that the data is seeing now in sack avoidance. I'm actually going to bring up Marino here just for posterity, just so that we can see here how unbelievable Dan Marino was at this. When you look at sort of him uh, during the course of his career, now we don't have all the stats, but, Dan Marino is for seven years in the league. Now those, again, 3.3%, Thomas, those are similar to what Matt Ryan's numbers were his first few years with you. Now it wasn't enough to lead the league because maybe somebody else led the league there, but like, this is amazing stuff, right? Where you're taking 15 sacks in a combined two seasons. One of them was strike shortened, but still an amazing feat for him. The funny part was even later in his career, do you remember Thomas, how the Dolphins ended Marino or how Marino's career ended? No. So, so Marino, 12 touchdowns, 17 picks. Still good enough for that Dolphins team to make the playoffs because he led the league in sack avoidance. 
that Miami team, uh, their final Marino's final game in the NFL, they lost 62 to seven to Jacksonville. Um, but I think the ultimate point is they were still able to make the playoffs, even though Marino was still throwing a lot of interceptions and not being as efficient because again, his ability to at least get the football off was a huge part of kind of his brilliance. And even, and again, like you think about Peyton Manning, you think about Tom Brady, you think about, you know, Patrick Mahomes right now, as, as you guys saw in the really, really well thought out sumersports.com leading the league in sack avoidance. You think about like what's ailing the chiefs, not being able to get wide receivers open as much, having a quarterback that can, extend plays and and give them another shot at being open is going to raise the floor of that offense. So there's so much you can evaluate a quarterback on. And I, and I hate to like distill it down to one thing, but if it is one thing, I think sack avoidance is my main is, is the stat I'm going to use. Uh, you got me on the edge of my seat here. Okay. I'm going to present a couple other, three other opportunities to, to for you to rebut. Okay. First of all, when you talk about um, the O-line, right? If we went back and did a true study on on the Dolphins O-line versus, you know, we're using Matt Ryan as another example on their O-line, on some of the other quarterbacks that we're referring to, I think that's going to be an important part. I think the other thing is when you're talking about the plays that these these quarterbacks were running and the scheme that they were running, your buddy, J.T. O'Sullivan, who's got a lot of strong opinions about a lot of things, could compliment or comment on that, of course. He knows how that is, right? I would say to you, when a quarterback has confidence in their O-line and the plays and the success of their plays, are they going to take less sacks? They are, in my mind. I've seen it when you have a quarterback who hasn't lost his accuracy, who hasn't lost his athleticism in the, in the two or three years, but the O-line is flailing. He's always on the run. And I just I think his accuracy flails because he's worried about potentially getting sacked. So I just I wonder how that all plays in together and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I agree. I think the offensive line certainly has a part to play. And, you know, Dwight Stevenson was, a you know, an amazing center for the Dolphins. Right. And Richmond Webb was a, you know, ring of honor caliber left tackle for them. I but at the same time, I look at Peyton Manning, it's like Tarek Glenn. It's uh, Oli, not Oli Udo, but it's like George. I can't remember. Who, I, it, this is like, I think, illustrative of the point. I don't remember who the left tackle was for a lot of those Colts team. And, and I remember everybody. Right. So it's like it. it so I, I agree with you. But there's an there are article I wrote back uh, 2019 for PFF kind of looking at like who owns pressure rates and, and by extension sack rates. And the offensive line certainly factors into that a lot. The, the quarterback, though, owns a decent amount of it, right? Like, you, um, you know, you drafted some pretty good offensive line. You had a good offensive line in Atlanta. But, you know, a lot of times, like, those same offensive linemen for Atlanta right now are pretty damn good, right? And yet Desmond Ritter is still taking sacks because his pocket awareness is not necessarily commensurate with a guy of Matt Ryan's stature. You know what I'm saying? So that's where I get a little bit concerned. I think about like the, uh, my, my friend, Matt Collar, who's been on this show before he did a study about Kirk cousins and how Kirk is notoriously easy on his tackles, but harder on the guards because of where he sets up. I just think the quarterback, and I know I don't want to trivialize this too much because we're going to talk about offensive linemen a little bit. I think offensive linemen matter at the extremes in both directions, but I think in the middle of the distribution, quarterbacks control so much of how this goes to the point where, I mean, your old team, the Patriots, left tackle went from like Nate Soldier to, uh, you know, to Trent Brown, you know, to uh, Cameron Fleming. To guy, like, they've had good offensive linemen and bad offensive linemen. And I, Brady's kind of done, he kind of did everything even with those. I think like the great quarterbacks – are good manipulators of the conditions that they're in. And to your point, if it gets bad, the accuracy goes down. But some of that is is part of the maturation process for a quarterback, yeah? Yeah, no question about it. I, I mean, maturation of the quarterback is a huge deal, and, I, and I, I would love to continue to talk about quarterbacks here. I'm just curious when we start talking about O-line, though, do you, do, are you ready to, to move over to O-line yet, or do we, we want to stay with the quarterback thing? Yeah, let's do it. I, I think this will be even more because I think this will this will make us think about things even more. My take here on offensive line. Yeah. And I 
again, I would love to talk to, about quarterbacks for the rest of the day here, but I want to make sure we get into O-line because you've been outspoken before about this idea that run blocking of the O-linemen and the efficacy of their run blocking ability, efficacy of their blocking compared to pass blocking is more important. Can you expound on that, please? Because you'd have a lot of us in the GM roles disagreeing with you. Not saying it's not important, but a run blocker, we feel you can find any day where a pass blocker it becomes very complicated. Yeah, and right now at SumerSports.com, you can actually look at how good offensive line combinations are. You can also look at the proportion of snaps that they've played together. So, for example, that's a lot of those Falcons. Those are a lot of Thomas Dimitrov draft picks there with uh, McGarry, Lindstrom, and, and so forth. Uh, SumerSports.com is where you can go for that. No one, to my knowledge, in the space is doing that. So uh, give SumerSports.com uh, uh, a little bit of a look there. My point is, is this. Given what we just talked about, where what quarterbacks control pressure rates more than I think the average person thinks, wide receivers and their ability to separate makes life easier on the quarterback to get rid of throws early and have them be effective. Couple that with the fact that they're in the run game, the offensive line controls the game so much more than the running back and so forth, that if I'm constructing an offensive line and I'm trying and I might look at the market inefficiency that is great run blockers. And for a few reasons, why again, if I can get a guy who is an, in your scale an eight as a run blocker and a six as a pass blocker, my quarterback can engineer my quarterback can make that six into a seven evidently on the on the margins by being good with the pocket avoiding sacks and all that my running back cannot make my offensive line run block better so I, the way that they an offensive lineman can have the biggest impact is actually run run blocking better because it's so the the, the success an offense has running the football is so much more tied to how well they run block than how well they pass block. Because as we just talked about for the first 15 minutes of the show, quarterbacks have a lot of control over their pressure rates and their sack rates. In addition, most linemen who are good at or bad are good at bad at both, right? So if you select for a great run blocker, chances are if he's a great run blocker, he's at least an okay pass blocker. And when I think about pass blocking the chain links, I just need all five guys to be okay. So if I have five okay pass blockers and I have two guys who are absolute kick-ass run maulers, I'm going to have a pretty good offensive line on balance for my team. Wow, I could go on and on about this. I don't agree with you that most run blockers who are good are adequate pass blockers. Maybe the other way around a little bit. You can get some big-ass maulers who just lean into people and occupy and they're good run blockers, and then you get them out slide and mirroring and the ability to use their hands quickly. And all of a sudden they're all over the place. They're flailing. So I, uh, that's one of the things I really wanted to talk about. I mean, I've seen, we've drafted and, and been around and acquired a number of O linemen that can get their body on people and occupy. The other thing that I think is important is, is to note is you're talking about sk the scheme on the run blocking, right? You're talking about zone scheme, what we did, what we did with um, um, Shanahan when, when Kyle was at our place in, in Atlanta was one thing. And what we did later with our offense with Dirk Cutter was very different in our run game, right? Our guys were doing certain things that showed like they were really good run blockers. And quite honestly, when we had expected them to pass block, they just could not bend. They were erect. They lunged. They were slow with their hands and or had short arms, which – don't get into me, get, get, get uh, onto me about short arm O linemen because I think you can make up for some of it if you have quick adeptness within your, your hands and your ability to place. Anyway, thoughts? Yeah, there's a good comment here. Sean asks, is there data showing the benefit of offensive line continuity? There is. It's worth about half a point to the point spread for every two linemen that are injured. Um, so th that's an important point. I want to circle back because you said something that makes my reasoning for what I just said, in my opinion, more valid, which is pass protection for all schemes is largely the same. You know, pass blocking, there are different rules, but like the distinctions in run scheme are so much, are the variability is so much bigger, right? Where 
if I have a guy who's an outside zone, inside zone kind of blocking scheme guy, and I try to play him in a man power counter sort of scheme, he's going to fail. And I think that that difference is also why I select for certain run blockers, because if I select a guy that doesn't fit my pass blocking scheme that much, the differences in scheme to me is not that big. So I, I, I fail less picking a guy for his run blocking ability than I do his pass blocking ability because changes in scheme will affect my run game more than it will affect my pass game. To your point, though, that's why these that's why having good scouts are, is important in the sense that, like, for me, I'm trying to look at the margins. I'm trying to look at a guy who the whole league is like, ah, oh, he's terrible at pass protection. I don't want to look at him at all. Whereas, like, I might see a guy who's like, he's passable as a pass blocker. He's tremendous as a run blocker, especially in this scheme. And when and, and my whole issue is like, for the majority of offensive linemen, at least if you look at grades, and I'm looking obviously at PFF, SIS, all those like, maybe it's different when you look at internals. But like the generally speaking, there are very few players who are so bad at one thing and so good at another that it's prohibitive. I would eliminate those players for sure. But if on the margins, if a guy is like superior as a run blocker and passable as a pass blocker, and I have a quarterback that can control pressure rates, I think you can find a value on the market with those players. I agree with you. I mean, I, I was sitting there going to Peter Kahn's, who was one of my biggest mistakes as an offensive line draft pick. And quite honestly, he had the athleticism to move around and get his ass around, wall off. He would bend. Pass protector, he had the ability and the, the smarts and awareness to do it. Abil ability on both sides, you know, to thrive. But he didn't thrive, which brings me around to passion, drive for the game, which I, I'm only segueing into that because you could have a good run blocker or a good pass blocker, or you could have a good pass blocker and a run blocker that had the ability, athletic ability, and the ability to bend and get his feet in the right spot and the, and the agility to move around, pull, second level, all the stuff you're talking about, run blocking, but didn't have the passion, drive, and desire to finish the play. And then they're no longer what we think is very good. They're, we're thinking, we got to get rid of this guy. So anyway, I'm, it's, a, it's an interesting yeah. It's funny. I was growing up like I was in track and field, and I was also eventually in offensive line rooms as a tight end in college. And the, the similarities, even though the body types are so different between like a 400 meter dash guy and an offensive lineman, the, the similarities are striking in what you've just said, which is for offensive linemen, the guy's got to nail it from a mental standpoint because you're up against athletic athletes that are just so much better than you are. You think about like the three techniques in the NFL now with Donald, Fletcher Cox, uh, Quinn and Williams, like all those players are big, fast and strong. And you're all, and if you play tackle, it's even worse, right? The athletic mismatch between you and Joey Bosa, Nick Bosa, Donnell Hunter, like all those guys is immense. You have to have the mental acuity of somebody who is like a distance runner, where it's just like, it's a long game. You're not coming out right They're They're subbing in and out. You're staying in the whole time. You're not coming out. You got to time the snaps. You got to do all those things. It's so striking to me how similar those two things are to the point where, I agree with you. Like, I think if I were to rank offensive line traits and maybe, maybe you can come, you know, maybe you can, uh, you know, dispute this, but to me, it's, it's mental, you know, having the mental aspect down. Second one is how good they are in a run blocker in your scheme. And then thirdly, how good are they as a pass blocker in your scheme? I think if I have those three things and I can check them off in that order, I'm going to take the lineman. And I think like, but if he has the mental acuity to me, I think that there's so much like there's so much positioning. There's so much uh, ways in which an offensive line can lineman can win mentally that to me, that's the number one trait of an offensive lineman. Yep. And and they have to have back to the confidence, right? They have to have consistency yep. and confidence about them in their game at so many levels. Uh, but I completely agree. Completely agree. OK, so you don't agree necessarily with me on run blocking and pass blocking, yeah. but you'll get there. I'll convince you. I'm a convincing guy. Um, you're almost there on sack rate with me, too. Like, I like this. I like the fact that we have different opinions on these things. Yeah. No, I have different. When I say I completely agree, I completely agree with certain points within the points. But if, if I'm evaluating to put together a team and I'm sitting there with Mike Smith or Dan Quinn when the time was the time, you know, we weren't just focusing, we weren't saying we're going to override everything on the run blocking side. 
quite honestly, we thought we could teach the run blocking more than we could teach the pass blocking. That's all I'm saying. And that was a concern of ours. How do we, how do we really dial in on it? this? Again, we could carry on and on about it. Keep bringing it up over the months as we're looking at draft picks. And free I want, I want to ask you one more question. I, I love this discussion because it's, you know, we can preview games or whatever, but it's kind of like, this is more fun. If you are the director of player personnel, like let's say you're the GM equivalent of a college football team. Is there value in developing players for the NFL specifically? And I want to bring this up because I actually, I, I did a podcast last week with my friend Sage Rosenfeld, a quarterback, former NFL quarterback, very smart guy. And we were talking about the early aughts when Lovey Smith and Mike Fra- or, uh, and Leslie Frazier and Mike Tomlin and uh, Tony Dungy, they were all kicking the league's ass with the too high safety look, right? Very similar today. The Tampa two was all the craze. And you remember how NFL teams eventually took the cover two out of existence. They ran against it and they ran the tight end up the seam. And you think about Tony Gonzalez, you think about uh, Dallas Clark, you think about there were so many Antonio Gates, uh, Vasante Shanko, all these. There were so many more good tight ends in the NFL back then than there are now. We've devolved as a league in developing tight ends that are any good. And I put this in the notes earlier. Like, we just don't have, if I want, I'm going to go present this as well to, uh, I, I love plugging the Sumer Sports website because it's so, it's so fun and intuitive and it gives people an opportunity to, um, you know, sort of peek into our value system. But you look at the tight end position now, like Sam Laporta, I, I look at the top guys. Do you see a, a, a common theme, Thomas, in three of the top four guys uh, in this list of tight ends? Well, I, I see it in the top five, probably. I mean, you're talking about a common theme. Are you looking well, for so the right answer versus this, the fact that these guys – all have the ability to be kind of a, a dual force. They're both athletic. They also are tough asses. They're also consistent with what they do. Yeah, I could go on and on about it. I see Sam Laporta went to Iowa. I see TJ Hawkinson went to Iowa. And I see George Kittle went to Iowa. I see. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and I think about what wins in college football is not the way Iowa plays offense, right? Like we, I mean, they're, it's a battle for them to get to 20 points every Saturday, right? Yep. However, they make tight ends a lot of money in Iowa by playing, by teaching them how to play NFL tight end. And to your point, right, Kyle Pitts is one of the best athletes we've ever seen at the position. He's the highest drafted tight end in the history of the NFL. And I think that there's a little bit, when you watch the Falcons, they play John U. Smith sometimes more than they play Kyle Pitts because John U. Smith can put his hand in the grass and block a six eye and all this kind of stuff. I think that if I was a GM, like if I was at that GM level at a college program, director, player, whatever, whatever they call it at, at the college level, it varies depending upon um, the college. I would find a way to build a program where we developed positions that the NFL needs, but college football doesn't value. Inline tight ends. I don't know if I'd talk if I'd do fullback, but um, all around linebackers like the college football doesn't really value all. You know, right now, if I watch and I'm not the you know, you might be amazed that I'm actually like I watch these bear fronts in college football where the linebackers are stacked behind the D linemen and there's like they get the fullest protection. When you get to the NFL, you got to take on guards. You got to be athletic enough to take you know t- to cover guys down the seam. But you have to be tough enough to take on guards. There's like five linebackers in the whole league that are that good, right? If I were a college program, I would, I would build, I would build a, a at least one position where we're just a, an NFL factory, and teams that covet players at those positions actually can go to our school and expect players to be NFL caliber at something that the NFL covets, but at college football does not. Okay, and so what are you looking for? What what answer are you looking for? So I'm just because you obviously built teams. I haven't, right? So I'm looking for yeah. your insight. When you're bit like, is there value in doing that? Like Iowa with tight ends, or you know, some other school with linebackers, or even like Alabama. You think about your your former colleague Nick Saban. 
Alabama develops the Brian Branches and the Minka Fitzpatrick's and that like hybrid safety corner group. Part of that's because Alabama is so talented that even their nickel guy is talented. But part of that is also just like knowing what the league wants and knowing that, you know, the more players you get drafted high, the better. I, I'm a, if you were directing, if you were a college football, like personnel director, yeah. you know, GM type, would you, is that, is that a viable approach? To develop for the NFL? Yeah. Sure. Yes. I mean, if you're talking about placement and you're talking about, you know, being recognized for how you are producing players for the next level. Yeah. I mean, of course it is. And, you know, in today's world, I think those are the people that are going to benefit the program. They're going to benefit the coach. They're going to benefit the coaching staff. Yes. I don't know. I could go on and on about it. I don't want to, I don't want to ramble off on it, but yes, I do believe, you know, back to Iowa back at Alabama, back at USC, Ohio State, yes, we just saw I, I didn't see who, who just put the – Ryan. Yeah, no, Ryan, right on, for sure. Wide receivers, for sure, at Ohio State. Look, we, we are, as, as team builders and general managers and, and head coaches, how many times we talk about programs and what they're doing at those positions is a big thing. At all, you know, everyone's got a line. Just it, – it, there's reality and there's uh, – what am I trying to say? There's basically – um, we used to, I think I mentioned this before. We used to look at, sorry, your alma mater. We used to look at, at Nebraska and we'd say, yes, they produced really adept O linemen, but they were all beaten up. Shane, Shane, Sean, Sean is talking about, you know, Wisconsin and Wisconsin linemen. They had a lot of good O linemen over the years. Did they always work out? BYU, the same thing. They would produce some pretty good football players, O line and such. Did they work out in the NFL? We have to do the digging back in there and look at the history and look at look at how they progress. And, and that is a big part. If it's the same program, if meaning the same coaches or, or at least some carryover, you can't just say, you know, BYU is never producing O linemen. That's ridiculous. Right. Because they always have different o, o line coaches there, of course. But uh, so anyway, yes, really interesting topic for sure. And it does it does matter for us as GMs and head coaches. Yeah, I just I just think from like your perspective as an NFL general manager, your goal is to win the Super Bowl as quickly as possible, right? And and that goal is a reasonable goal for all 32 teams to have if you if you widen the 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 time period. No offense, but I was never going to win the national championship in college football. And and that's not and that's not anything against Kirk Ferentz. That's not anything against Brian Ferentz. It's not anything against Iowa as a state. The way things are, it's just going to be hard, right? And so if I'm Western Kentucky, like Western Kentucky, Bailey Zappi, now they have Austin Reed, like that's a backup quarterback factory, right? <laughs> and and I, I think if you're a college football program that's not trying to compete for – sorry – a college football program for for which it's going to be incredibly hard to win a championship because of the way things are in college football. I would optimize for getting the most players into the NFL at the most at the most positions, right? And to and to have that be my staple so that maybe eventually you can get to that point where you're a, where you're attractive to young players that want to make it to the NFL and then maybe you can be a college football playoff contender, but until that point I feel like you're optimizing for getting alumni back in the building, getting getting donations, obviously, from alumni that go to the NFL and get second contracts and all of that stuff to me. And then it's going to make the NFL better because all the way back to my first point, Thomas, none of us like seeing defenses having as much success as they're having right now. And back in the in the aughts, it was, you know, Marcus Pollard running up the field. It was Dallas Clark. It was like all those great offenses, Thomas, had – I mean, Gronk, Hernandez, Daniel Graham, who you guys drafted, Ben Watson, who you guys drafted. Like, all those great offenses had a tight end that's much better than the average tight end today. And I think that that's because college football is optimized for the spread game, running backs, wide receivers. NFL, is that's their only talent pool. And because of the rookie contracts the way they are, you can't develop a tight end as long as you want to because by year four, that's their contract season. And – and so it's just incredibly hard unless these guys come into the NFL ready-made and they only come into the NFL ready-made from a couple different programs. Yes, there you go. Great proselytizing. I like it. Thank you.
Well, I, I was, you know, my dad's a, my dad's a minute. Like I have it a little bit in my blood. Uh, so maybe I'm, I'm decent at it, but um, cool. I just wanted to talk through those three topics. We had, a, we had a good time with it. Quarterbacks. It's always amazing. I always have to go back Thomas and check on Marino stats because I never do truly believe them in my heart. Uh, even though they are true in my brain, how good he was at avoiding sacks and how much that that was a part of the way that he uh, ended up being as a quarterback. So it was fun to go. It was fun to chat about that. As far as week four, no, we're in week four, Thomas. Yeah, yeah. What's uh, like, I mean, what are you looking forward to this weekend? Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to putting you on the spot first before you just putting me on the spot on what I'm looking forward to, because I'm looking forward to quite a bit. We're talking quarterbacks before we move on. Okay, you ready to be put on the spot? Sure. Okay. I'm going to ask you to differentiate between two quarterbacks. Who's more talented? Can you do it? Or are they too close to you? Sage Rosenfels and JT O'Sullivan. I don't want to piss. Listen. I don't. Both are listening. Right Both now. are listening. I, um, Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I hope this isn't a cop out, but if it's the Mike Mart system, I'm taking JT because okay. JT slung it around, moved around the pocket pretty well. You know, if it's a Shanahan system, I'm taking Sage because I think Sage is like a, a very good, you know, Sage is a bigger guy. I, I actually, I don't know. I Sage is a big guy. I have to go look at JT's like size and stuff. I, I, I would say they're probably dead even. But I would take JT in a – I would take JT in more of like a spread um, – in a spread offense that involved, you know, kind of the Mike Mart system. Yeah, JT 6'2", 232. Not that, you know, not that small actually. Um, but but Sage is a bigger guy. I, I would take Sage in sort of more of a play action kind of Shanahan dual threat quarterback role than I would take JT. I'd take JT more in a drop back spread system. How big is Sage? What do you think? How big is Sage? Uh, Do you have it there? Anecdotally, like 6'4", 230, I would say. Is he? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, let me let me look quickly. 6'4", 222. Um, uh, JT is listed at 6'2", 230. So maybe a, a little thicker, but shorter. Yeah. I can't call it. That's why I was asking you, copping out on it. I really can't call it. Look, they yeah, both, I mean, they both were, they both were, had their places in the NFL and both contributed well to the NFL at, at, at levels, you know, of course, hands down. Look, I, I've been very open with everyone about this. We never spent time focusing on that, you know, that backup quarterback that could help us win if Matt got hurt. I mean, Matt Law, he, he literally was hurt in one and a half games in, in our entire time there. I mean, how many times Arthur said to me quietly, Thomas, are you going to help us out here and get someone in place? We should have gone out for guys like this, right? To be ready to take over when things got a, went awry and we didn't. So I'll raise my hand on that. Yeah, I mean, look, the Jets are going through that right now. I mean, uh, I think it's very rational that they hung on to Zach Wilson given they used the second pick on him. And if you get a veteran in the game to back up Rodgers, you're basically saying that that pick has no chance. And so I, I kind of understand them being like, let's have Wilson here. Now, when Rodgers got hurt, this is blown up on them because they don't have a veteran guy. I don't know how much Trevor Simeon is going to do. He was just signed this week. Um, you guys, I mean, look, you're being hard on yourself. You guys had Chris Redman, who did start for the Ravens. He was a holdover from the Bobby Petrino years because he played for Bobby at Louisville. Like, he was fine. I mean, not a great backup, but not not a disaster. Matt Schaub, you know, Matt Schaub, I think, threw for like 500 yards in the one start that he started for you guys way back. Uh, he, Schaub, the, the wheels fell off of Schaub at Houston, but he was a good backup, I, I would always say. Like, you know, and he, he was actually the guy that started over Sage when Sage played in Houston. So, like, he has good familiarity there, too. It, You guys didn't do so bad there, I would say. I'd be you know what how are you, like what kind of backup would be a better guy than 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 Matt Shaw? No, Matt Matt and and Matt really love him. I think he's a quality guy, very smart. He was really good for our program leadership wise, right? No question. So was Chris Redman. My point was only, you know, if the wheels truly came off and Matt were to be losing legit time, it was complicated. And and anyone we're talking about here, the two quarterbacks you just 
went toe to toe with. Everyone knows how how important it is to make sure that you also have the right people in. Right. I used to find it so uh, almost insulting, but unfair for the backups when we'd put them in in preseason. Right. I'm thinking, oh, my God, how are we really judging our backups with all of our thirds and fourths in? I mean, it was really unfortunate and unfair. And we made decisions off of that at times. It's got to be a better way to do it. Well, especially when he's a backup that used to be a starter, it's sort of like weird to see Matt Schaub out there with a bunch of third stringers when the guys made a Pro Bowl before, you know, and 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 engineered like a 12-win season. I think for young guys, it's fine. But, like, I also think, I mean, Thomas, if you get, you know, let's say let's say you were, you know, now with all the rules different, like you're at, you're, you have your, your chance at the plate again, you're keeping three quarterbacks, right? Like this is this is something where the league tries to skirt around this a little bit and try to keep more special teamers. But, you know, with the kickoff rule the way it is and how special teams have kind of been diminished, I don't see the value in an extra corner to play vice on special teams when I can develop a backup. And more importantly, we saw this with your old boss, uh, um, uh, Bill Belichick he just signs players off practice squads just to mess with these other teams. Right. When the Bengals were struggling with Burrow, they signed, I think it was, I I believe it was Will Greer. They just signed Will Greer off the practice squad just to mess with the Bengals. And you can do that when a guy's a practice squad player, that's the whole thing about having that third quarterback on your 53 is that no one can touch him and he can actually develop and not have to swap rosters every single time. I remember 2014, Thomas, Ryan Lindley started a playoff game for the Cardinals after being cut by the Cardinals in preseason and playing for San Diego all year and then getting taken off the practice squad. Like that's not a good thing for a quarter. That's not a good for a quarterback. And Case Keenum was the same. Case Keenum was cut by Houston in the preseason, was on the Rams practice squad all year, and then got signed off to start for Houston in play in games that mattered. And I'm like, this, you would, I think about the league and like not to go on a rant, but you think about the quarterbacks that played in the Super Bowl in the early aughts. Jake DeLome was a third string quarterback for a lot of his life. Mm-hmm. Rich Gannon was a third string quarterback for a lot of his life. Tom Brady was a third string quarterback his rookie year and a backup his second year. Um, Kurt Warner was a, a third string quarterback for the St. Louis Rams for a couple years before he was the guy. That's not happening now. And I, I, I'm i sad for that, right? Like the fact is, is like Tony Romo was an insurance policy in case Drew Henson sucked, right? Like that's, it's insane to me how we just don't take these gambles on on quarterbacks i mean jt jt had a and my, my one of my good friends bruce Gregkowski. those guys were in the league because there was a third quarterback and then eventually they were good backups yeah. how do you get those guys to be good backups when there's not enough roster spots for them and no one wants to develop these players no question and 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 those really good backups that could teeter over and and take take the helm i mean those guys are are worth it in gold i think and again, we just were very fortunate not to have to deal with that. But if I could go back again, I mean, back to three quarterbacks, back to drafting every year, you know, we know how important a, a viable quarterback is and a stall of viable quarterbacks is probably more and more important today than it ever was. So, yeah. Yeah. Especially now. I mean, guys are getting hurt a lot, even, I mean, there's just not as much practice time and stuff and like the player. Yeah. It, it's weird. I think that, um, that position, there's just such value in, in holding those assets uh, in, in a way that other teams are, are coveting your players. I mean, the Jets, gosh, it'd be nice if, if uh, you know, the Jets had a viable trade off uh, option so that they could be a viable offense for the last, you know, 14 weeks of the year, because you know that Joe and, and Robert Salah are, are really, um, you know, they're hurt right now because they don't have the, the, the quarterback that can make their, make their team viable right now. So, um Okay. Anything you're looking forward to week three? I mean, any games that you're that you're excited? I mean, tomorrow, Detroit, Green Bay. Detroit is favored against Green Bay in Green Bay against a non-backup quarterback for the first time since the turn of the century, Thomas. Yeah, I think that I mean I'm I'm really interested to continue to watch Detroit after they obviously took it to Atlanta. And with each game, I become more and more impressed. Not that I was against them, but I've always busted you a little bit. Like, are you jumping on the bandwagon? What I was really impressed with watching against Atlanta, who I think is a gritty team, they took it to them. They had them back on their heels. They were they were smoking people on their defense. I was really happy to see that because that that's one of the things I worried about. And, you know, 
Jared Goff, I mean, the way that he continues to play, I want to see him go head to head with Jordan Love and see where that is because both of those guys, you know, I'm watching closely. Can they take it, you know, to the end? You know, are they the competitors? Can they do it when shit really hits the fan? It's the only way I could say it. Can they truly do that? And can Jordan do that? I mean, Jordan came back and did what he did last game, and I thought that was impressive. But why did it take so long? I don't know. You might have an opinion of that statistically, or, you know, or analytically. Well, and why? Why? Yeah, like why it took a backup. It took the Saints quarterback getting hurt, right? And and that thing slowing down. And the Saints. I mean, it, the Saints the other day were a classic example of when you don't try to lose a game. And I get it, it's natural when your backups in there to just kind of hold on to a lead. But instead of the Saints trying to push the pedal and beat the Packers, they tried just not to lose that game. And and Jordan Love, you know, was there. Um, I, I'm very interested as well. I think the Packers, as an underdog with with Christian Watson, Aaron Jones, and David Bakhtiari, presumably all back and playing on 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 Thursday night, I think are – a very viable team. And I, I I'm excited to see it because both teams kind of I'm rooting. I like, I have I, I the underdog mentality for me, both for Detroit, but also green Bay without Rogers to me is appealing. So I'm just really excited for that game. Um, and, and I, and it's probably the most important game for Detroit in five, six years. So it, it's, it's cool to see that. And, and obviously green Bay, you know, uh, being able to stay viable without Rogers has been a good story as well. No question. I look forward to a great day today. Thanks for the passion and your discussion here. Awesome. This has been fun. I, uh, I uh, really thank you all for, for joining the stream. Uh, if you've liked what you've uh, listened to, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Go to Apple Podcasts, by the way, and give our podcast a review. Um, and uh, it really helps out the show. There was a time, you know, a few months ago where a, a woman messaged me and said, hey, can you put timestamps on the podcast? Super easy for me to do. Makes the experience better. Uh, we really thank uh, Bad Gravity here. Thanks for the show. We really do appreciate uh, great talk. Thanks from Brandon Brooks. Um, very, very. We we do appreciate all of our listeners. We don't take you for granted. We we want to give you the best football content out there. Thomas and I are constantly talking about what what makes for the best show, and and hopefully today's discussion uh, was unlike any you're ever going to get. So, for Thomas Dimitrov, for Eric Eager, this has been episode 107 of the Sumer Sports Show. <laughs>